just uh, so that's when it's uh, when you the it was inception the, the stock exchange right? so that's, that's later on no 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 that, it's a bit when of the idea came yeah, yeah, yeah. to do this so the idea of Sujol it, it's I mean well, it was called it was called the Bangladesh project yes, when I first yeah, met it still, is for it, me it's the Bangladesh project it's still the Bangladesh project so we'll call it uh, so yeah how did it come to how did it come about well as I as we were busy um, on this micro water facility and looking for small scale solutions for water problems but also at the same time on a large scale to apply them on a large scale <laughs> uh, um, and we were very much on this water and um, we were also thinking about in developing country might we might in the future link small scale solutions on water with microfinance then I was reading just by coincidence because I'm not regularly reading it, I'm reading it irregularly, The Economist. Yeah. And there was an article in The Economist with an interview with Iqbal Qadir. Iqbal Qadir said in his interview, you know maybe who he is, no? no. Oh, he, he, he created the Grameen phone company. Oh yes, yeah. So yeah. he is a man who knows everything about microfinance yeah. and how to start with small things and do it on a big scale. Yeah. Huh? because the, the Green Phone Company is now one of the larger companies of uh, now part of Telecom and uh, Telenor, the Norwegian Telecom Company. Anyway, that's, that's a side by the way. But in his interview he said, we have been able to make a success of a small-scale technology, which is a technology which we have developed in the West, but we can apply it immediately in developing countries, like in Bangladesh, and couple it with microfinance and then we went ahead and it has been a success. Yeah. And he said, I'm now working on seeing if we can do the same kind of thing with small scale energy. Yeah. And he said, and eventually I think we should also start to look at this for small scale water. So then I thought, hey, <laughs> this, is, this is an interesting man. Yeah. So I tried to trace him through internet and through friends and so on. I finally found him, he was on holiday with his family in Geneva. He, he works with MIT, he's now a professor at MIT since then, since two years. Um, so, um, so I told him, just by telephone, I'd like to meet you because I have I've, I've read your article and we work on small-scale water solutions but we know nothing about microfinance. You know everything about microfinance and, and we and you know nothing about water. Why don't we combine forces? Yeah. And he said, well, I'll fly back. When we fly back, I'll make a stop over in Amsterdam. I'll see you there for an afternoon. And then he stayed for two days <laughs> here. And we talked all the time. <laughs> and then, uh, and then they said, and then they're, they're the best, aren't they, those kind of things? <laughs> <laughs> and then we decided, well, this is a, this is a, this, we don't know how this will end up, but this is an idea. Yeah. Let's start. So we then started a foundation called... Uh, Clean Water Foundation in America as a carrier to carry out this plan. And then I won't bother you with the, the various stages we went through to find out how do we do it, with whom do we do it, and, uh, and so on and so on. It took uh, about a year and a half or two before we found a way to, to do it. Yeah. And uh, from that moment on, uh, I, in, in, uh, I spoke to EMF and said, this is something which I think we should do within the micro for water facility and introduced uh, Frederick. And at the same time, I was, had been working with uh, Voltea for the last, from, from, from the inception. When Voltea started, I was right away from the beginning. And, and how long has Voltea? Six years now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so as, as I knew everything about Voltea, having been uh, involved with the, the whole startup and everything, and also being a shareholder. Uh, I knew what, what they were doing, mm -hmm. and I then asked them, can we use that technology also for removing us arsenic? And the answer was yes, and they did some trials. And as you probably know, uh, there are still some hiccups here and there, mm -hmm. which will happen always if you start to use new technologies. Yeah. But um, anyway, this combination of Voltea, and then, uh, we gave a presentation in America about the Voltaire technology, and I hired a student, Swedish, no, a Polish student, yeah. who was working here, uh, to, to do the whole thing. 
and she made an analysis of the chemical and the physical and everything of Voltea and the Bangladesh project. She went to Bangladesh. And so we more, more and more we could narrow it down to a social issue being resolved with the help of a technical issue. Yeah. So these things came together. And then um, uh, Iqbal was extremely involved and still is apart from his professorship, which takes him a lot of time, with this energy project in Bangladesh, still is, and I'm also a, sh a little shareholder there, yeah. so I keep contact with him on that. Yeah. But he said, I'm so busy with the energy, I just can't do any all these things t at the same time. Why could you, could you not take over completely the whole Bangladesh project, because I will be available for you to help you, I will be available to give you my contacts in Bangladesh, everything I can do for you, but I cannot work in the project, I don't have time. Yeah. So then it was moved to to here, yeah. and then eventually EMF became more and more involved, and then Frederick uh, became involved, and now I am out of it, and, and he's in it. And uh, so that's not a project which I have started; it's now in good hands, I think. Yeah. So, and we, I mean, we were just talking with with, with Fredo about this sort of this point in terms of the, the vision of it that's the, the that began it to where it is now, yeah. and. That's how, right. how it's got a long way to go, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, I, I think. Uh, I mean, uh, reaching the, the goal of uh, what is it, thirty thousand villages or so? Yeah. Uh, in my guess, would be that it yeah. will be another ten years. Yeah, and and what what do you think for the people who are involved with it? Do you, what do you think are likely to be the the, the issues we're going to face? What are the things you would say that we need to keep? keep in mind and and how do you think we need to approach them what do we need to keep at the back of our mind as we as well, we deal the, with them the, 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 the most important thing of course but number one that it is a sustainable solution and not a one shot deal that uh, after a month everybody forgets about it so it's it's sustainable in the sense of that it, it remains on the, on the it's map. still going to it's still going to work it's still going to be sold it's going to be it's, yeah, yeah. it remains on the map and it will expand yeah um, so that that's one thing the second thing is we must, of course, and that's always the same with no, new technologies, nothing new about that. But if you have a new technology which you apply in a new field, you will have problems. Yeah. Because n n nothing is ideal and something. So we should, yeah, I always take, think we should write take about... Take into account that this, that this will happen yeah. and this will, can be resolved if the basis of the technology is okay. Yeah. I, I often think we should we should write a little book about technologies that took time to get right. Yeah. It's like I was telling some this I was reading a book about the design of the Boeing seven four seven recently yeah. and the engines just didn't work for a while and they were testing them and they kept destroying yeah. themselves in yeah. flight. Yeah. And they had Boeing had line after line of planes yeah, with so concrete that's, ballast that's, at the front so the yeah. tip tails didn't tip back and it's it's I think people can give up too early on new technology, would yeah, you say? But, uh, you must have patience and, and sometimes you must have money as well. Yeah. I mean, we have two, we have three major shareholders now in Voltaire who are, who are uh, strong. There's Unilever, Rabobank and Pentair. Pentair is a very big American company who is launching today, actually, in the Las Vegas, the application of Voltaire in their house uh, point of view systems. That they sell in America. Yeah. So we have strong shareholders. We have shareholders who believe in the technology. We have had problems, and we still have sometimes problems. Yeah. Everybody is, of course, excited and yeah. irritated by that. <laughs> but at the same time, yeah, you must go. If you believe in it, go on, go on, go on. But yeah. the, the, sometimes, in this case, for instance, it takes a lot of money. Yeah. In the case of Bangladesh, it still doesn't take much money. So we have to build up a case which is, is, which is so obviously good that yeah. then the money might flow in yeah. from UNICEF or from other organizations. So, so we talked earlier about how over time you've drawn people from you know, industrial backgrounds. I mean, you yourself are from an industrial background mm -hmm. um, and you've drawn people from banking. Um, I'm really interested in it. Frodo and I were struggling to define the space that we all work in, which is, it's it's we're founda it's foundations, but it's it's not charity. It's not you know we're we're trying to build systems that work. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a different kind of. I haven't quite yeah. worked out the name for the sector, but no. you're <laughs> <laughs> well. Anyway, what I always say, our foundations are 
not for profit, but also not for loss. Yeah. So that we have to keep in mind. Yeah. Um, the money is an important aspect. You must have money to do things. Uh, the Americans say always money is not, not important, but it sure helps. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> and that's that's uh, that's the situation. So I, I think you know we we were talking earlier about about your, your writing and about this balance between economy and ecology. And, uh, you know, I'm aware that there's a lot of people who work in, in industries where they, they feel that what they're doing is, is only serving the need of, you know, uh, only serving economic needs. It's not, <coughs> it's not factoring in the ecology, the ecological aspects. Yeah. And, uh, I, I wondered what you, you know, how you think those people can actually make a difference the people that are kind of feel stuck in those environments at the moment where they're not achieving ecological benefits. Yeah. Well, I what? think the uh, the environment, but then I mean the social environment or the shareholders environment or the stakeholders environment of these companies are becoming a stronger and stronger voice uh, reflecting uh, this worry into the organization itself as well. I think this is what happened in the last 15 years. Companies became aware of the fact they just cannot ignore what the environment thinks about them. And so it becomes a matter of survival as well. And that's what they always say, rightly so. We have to, if we have, we have to survive, so we have to make money. But now it's also, we have to survive to make money, but we also have to survive to not be rejected by the society. Yeah. If society rejects us because we're foul players, then we will not survive. Yeah. I think it's as simple as that, actually. And that, again, is a message which has taken about 25 years to get through. <coughs> we have now in, in, in Amsterdam here, it is, I don't know whether you know, that um, the um, Global Reporting Initiative, mm -hmm. GRI, huh. is situated in Amsterdam. It started in America, it has also got into Europe, and now the head office of the GRI is here. It's all about global reporting of companies on their environmental performance. Yeah. And that didn't exist 25 years ago. Yeah. I saw it uh, emerge when I was in Washington a few times 25 years ago. And I at attended some of their meetings, which were still very rudimentary and very, yeah, a little bit uh, activist kind of thing. And now it has become an established group with uh, executives and yeah. the former banking men. Uh, Herman Mulder is now the chairman of the board there. Huh. I just met him by coincidence yesterday. Huh. So yeah, people are. The environment is is. I, and this 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 whole this whole issue seems to be changing very fast, doesn't it? I've got a good friend of mine is the marketing chief marketing officer at a, at a big big software company and I saw him a few weeks ago in California and he was talking about corporate social responsibility yeah, yeah. and but the, most of what they do is systems that really that, that run the engine of businesses the supply chains etc and yeah. we were talking and we were saying maybe it's it's really it's not corporate social responsibility it's, it's corporate reality mm -hmm. it's like how much energy do you use in different parts of your business yeah, how much how, water, how much water, how much water? Use, what, what does it cost yeah, what are different people paid in different parts of the supply chain? How much of the money that you paid yeah. for this product goes down? And then down? you find out lots of things that in the past you didn't even think about. Yeah. Because if you have the ecology in your mind, then you start, you look at these processes in a different way. Yeah. And you find solutions which in, in the end turn out to be profitable. Yeah. So, so Alad, it's, it's been great to meet you today. So, so thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, thanks for the time. Mm. Thanks. Thank you.